In this video, I'm going to describe the underlying data structure of most cryptocurrencies, the so-called blockchain. I'll explain how blocks of transactions are created, then linked together. I'll also explain the system designed to make this process more difficult. That's right, more difficult. Namely, proof of work. The concepts you learn about are common to many cryptocurrencies, but I'm going to focus on the most well-known of all, Bitcoin. Nearly all cryptocurrencies store their ledger data in a data structure called a blockchain. The idea of a blockchain predates Bitcoin by 17 years. Indeed, blockchains have applications other than cryptocurrencies, but that's another story. A blockchain, as the name implies, is like a daisy chain of data blocks, each containing a few thousand transactions. Periodically, another batch of transactions is packaged into a block and added to the chain. Creating and adding a new block is called mining. With Bitcoin, a new block is mined every 10 minutes. It's a misconception that Bitcoins are mined. They are not. Blocks are mined, and people get paid in Bitcoin to do it. Once a block has been added, it can't be changed or removed. If you want to reverse a transaction, you have to make a new one in a new block. A single Bitcoin block can be up to one megabyte in size. A typical transaction is about 250 bytes, which means that a single block will contain about 4,000 different transactions. The Bitcoin blockchain has grown exponentially since it was created. In February 2022, it was almost 400 gigabytes in size, and it keeps getting longer. A blockchain can be stored as one flat file, that is, a simple text file, or as a collection of files in a database. Bitcoin makes use of Google's LevelDB database system because of its simplicity. Therefore, the Bitcoin blockchain is made up of several database files, each of which contains multiple blocks. Let's dig a little deeper into the structure of an individual block and talk about how blocks are linked together. Each block in the chain contains a collection of transactions. Details of each transaction include a set of inputs, which is essentially where the cryptocurrency was transferred from, a set of outputs, which is the public key, also known as the Bitcoin address, of the recipient, and, of course, the amount of cryptocurrency that was transferred. For simplicity, the inputs and outputs have been illustrated here as the names of the sender and the recipient, but I'll say more about what individual transactions actually look like and the role played by public-private key cryptography in a later video. Each block also has a header, which contains general information about the whole block. The block header is relatively small, at only 80 bytes in size. It includes a version number. This is the version of the Bitcoin rules that were enforced when the block was mined. A timestamp, indicating the date and time the block was mined. The timestamp is actually stored as the number of seconds elapsed since midnight on the 1st of January 1970. The height of the block, that is, its position in the blockchain. The height of the very first block, the so-called Genesis block, was 1. The height of the second block was 2, and so on. The header also contains something called a difficulty and a nonce. These were used to make the block more difficult to mine, for reasons I'll explain shortly. In addition, the header contains a so-called Merkle root, created by hashing all the transactions in the block. I'll also explain hashing in a moment. Suffice to say for now, the Merkle root is a very large number that ensures none of the transactions can be modified without also having to modify the header. Crucially, the header contains a hash of the previous block's header. This is a very large number which serves as a pointer to the previous block in the chain. This is usually shown in hexadecimal format. Every block contains this information, except the Genesis block. This value is calculated by applying a hashing algorithm to the header data 
of the previous block. A hashing algorithm performs a sequence of complex calculations to arrive at a number called a hash value. Bitcoin uses the SHA-256 hash algorithm. You can try it out for yourself on the Cyberchef website, which, by the way, is a fantastic tool for learning about cryptography. First, select the hashing algorithm that you want to use. Then, include some input data. This is my imaginary block header. The output is a 256-bit number displayed in hexadecimal for convenience. Now, notice that if you make even the smallest change to the input data, the hash value is still 64 hexadecimal digits long, but otherwise it's completely different. Change the input back to what it was, and there's the original hash value again. The same input data will always produce exactly the same hash value. In fact, Bitcoin takes this hash value and applies SHA-256 again. I can do this easily in Cyberchef. Each block header has its very own double SHA-256 hash value. It's essentially a unique digital signature for the block. As I said, this is included in the header of the next block in the chain. In essence, then, a blockchain is a linked list. Now, suppose a hacker wanted to change the contents of a block, perhaps to transfer a large amount of Bitcoin to themselves. This would invalidate the block, and as you'll see in a moment, everyone would know about it. To go undetected, they would have to recalculate the Merkle root of the block they changed and update its header. But this would break the chain. So then they would have to recalculate the hash of the header and update the header of the next block to re-establish the link. But this would make the header of the next block wrong, so they would have to fix that one too. In fact, they would have to recalculate the hash value in the header of every block in the chain that came after the one they changed. All this recalculation would require some effort, but as you know, computers are pretty good at doing calculations. For that reason, Bitcoin deliberately makes it more difficult to calculate the hash of a block header by employing a system known as proof of work. Only blocks whose headers have certain hash values will be accepted into the blockchain. For a block to be acceptable, the hash of its header must be below a particular number called the difficulty target. The Bitcoin network adjusts this target up and down periodically, according to how frequently blocks are passing the test. This ensures that new blocks are only added to the blockchain every 10 minutes or so. If you examine individual blocks in the Bitcoin blockchain, I'm using the Bitcoin Blockchain Explorer here, you can see that the difficulty is given as a number that has gradually become bigger as time goes by. What you're looking at here is a measure of how much harder it is to find a valid hash these days than when the blockchain began. In fact, the difficulty target is much lower these days because there's so much more activity. A noticeable consequence of enforcing a difficulty target is that the hash value of a block header will have several leading zeros. A lower target, and therefore greater difficulty, means more leading zeros. It's highly unlikely, although not impossible, that the hash of a block header will be acceptable straight away. Therefore, it will need to be adjusted by adding some extra numeric data to the header. The so-called nonce. Nonce stands for number used only once. Discovering what this number is, is the challenge faced by anyone who wants to mine a new block. I can demonstrate how difficult it is to discover a nonce by trying to do it manually with Cyberchef. I'm going to start by supplying this imaginary header data as input. The value of the nonce is currently zero. And here's the result of applying SHA-256 twice. Now, suppose that the difficulty target is such that the hash must have four leading zeros 
Let's try a nonce of one. Well, that's no good. Two, three. This could take a long, long time. One of the most important features of a hash value is that you can't use it to calculate the original data that it was derived from, even if you have a perfect understanding of how the hashing algorithm works. Hashing is like scrambling eggs. You can't go backwards. Therefore, the only practical way to find a valid hash for a block is by systematically trying every possible nonce until you find one that gives you a hash value smaller than the target. You could, of course, simply guess and hope that you get lucky. I wrote a program to do this for me, and it took my program, running on a general purpose PC, a few milliseconds to find this value. There are my four leading zeros. To find a nonce that would give me a hash value with eight leading zeros took my program three and a half hours. However, once the nonce is known, it can be easily applied to check to see if a link in the blockchain has been broken. So again, imagine a hacker trying to change a transaction. The amount of computational work involved would probably stop them in their tracks. Another feature of a cryptocurrency that makes it almost impossible to hack is the fact that it's a distributed ledger running on a vast peer-to-peer -peer network. Anyone who owns some Bitcoin can install the Bitcoin software on their computer, which can then participate as a node on this network. There are tens of thousands of interconnected nodes on the Bitcoin network. Every single node holds a copy of the entire blockchain. When a new transaction is proposed, every node in the network verifies the transaction, and if more than half of the nodes agree, it can be added to the blockchain. This means that if you want to hack the blockchain, you would have to take control of over half of the computers in the network. In the next video, I'll say more about verifying transactions and the role of the Merkle root.